Hey everyone, so now that you understand how force vectors work, we can talk about how force vectors play into frames and what frames are. I'm starting to hear a lot more people talk about frames while they're teaching it. Frames are rigid formations used to manage the range or access levers on our opponent's body. And so in this video, we're going to break it down into great detail. Huh? Oh, what a beautiful frame. So a frame is a rigid formation used to manage the range, support weight, or access levers on our opponent. Frames are used to oppose the direct opposite force vector, but can withstand perpendicular force with inertia. Frames need to be effective and efficient. Effective, how much force can the frame absorb? And efficient, how long can we hold this? And so with frames, we're looking to use our bones to support the weight. So if we look at our arm, we can see how there's basically two different frames here, the humerus and the forearm, in which we have to have them aligned with each other so that they're going to be able to oppose the force vector that's oncoming. However, if force is applied at a perpendicular angle, the arm is now being accessed as a lever. The bones are no longer supporting that force vector, and so the shoulder is trying to support the weight through muscle. Here, if the arms are bent, now the force is going to travel from the hand all the way from a straight line to the shoulder, and now the humerus and forearm are going to be accessed as levers the whole way through. And so now muscle is trying to support the weight and we're no longer going to be efficient or effective. So frames are used to manage the range and being able to support weight or the force their opponent is generating. So the example that we usually use when we're demonstrating it is a push-up. I can hold a push-up with my arms bent and still be effective but it's not actually efficient. I'm not gonna be able to do that for a very long period of time because my muscles are so engaged, I'm gonna to start to get tired. And so the reason why I'm able to be effective there is that my muscles are able to handle the magnitude of force, which is just gravity pulling down my upper body at that point. However, when we're looking at dealing with more skilled opponents, or if we're looking at dealing with people that are potentially bigger than us, the magnitude of force that they're gonna be able to generate is gonna be much more significant. And so, if we try and hold something with our muscles and having our arms bent where they're not proper frames, where we're using our skeleton, our bones aligned over top of our joints stacked, then we're gonna potentially be running into failure, especially if we're much smaller. So the idea of proper frames in a push-up is basically a plank where I'm able to hold this position now, and I can continue talking, and there's no problem here. It's just bones. If Kevin was to sit on me at this point, I'm able to support this weight because I got bones, I got the force transferring through my wrists, through my forearms, into my elbows, straight through to my shoulders. However, with the magnitude force changing at this point, if I tried to support him with my muscle, the frames fail. You've been very naughty, Bender. What? Me? I didn't do nothing. You're thinking of the kid. My God. God, Bender, framing an orphan. That's so naughty, I'll have to add it to my list right now. Mm, framing. So here, looking at some guard retention against a Toriando pass, here I frame against Kevin's shoulder, but my arm gets bent. And so now my bones are no longer aligned as a frame, and they're being accessed as levers as Kevin drives his body weight into me. And so now you can see how my wrist ends up getting collapsed up by my head, the frames fail, and he establishes chest-to-chest -chest connection. This time I'm gonna make an effort to lock my arms out completely. So now my wrist is aligned with my elbow, aligned with my shoulder. And now I'm gonna be able to absorb all of Kevin's body weight and now use the frames to support him while I mobilize my hips and reestablish guard. Here in a very similar example to the force vectors video, here I have my arms locked out, but they're not aligned with each other. And so the force is gonna go out my shoulder, accessing my arm as a lever. My left arm cannot absorb the weight and I get collapsed. Here I try and make my arms as straight as possible. They're not gonna be always straight to oppose the force vector, but now I'm gonna be able to absorb a lot more horizontal force. And so this will be a more proper way of aligning both my arms so that I have a frame from my wrist through my shoulders all the way to my other wrist generating base into the mat. Here in another angle, another mistake that people commonly make is that they have their chest to turn towards their opponent. And so now the force, my left arm is locked out, but the force is actually gonna be generating and traveling through my left shoulder because my chest is turned. And so my left shoulder is gonna end up getting collapsed backwards. And then this also puts me at risk of a shoulder injury on my right shoulder. 
Here I make sure my chest is turned completely perpendicular so that now I have a straight line from my wrist all the way through to my other wrist as if there was a metal bar going through me. As Kevin drives into me, I now am supporting him with my bones. I'm able to support that weight. This is a more complicated framing scheme in which I have to have my arms aligned in the same direction as my legs and my core has to bridge the gap here. So I have my arms at a 45 degree angle, my legs at a 45 degree angle so that I can absorb the force effectively. However, if my knees were pointed up, then my posture would be broken and the frames would be misaligned. So here I have my arms at a 45 degree angle, but my legs are not matching the force vector and so my base is ineffective. My legs are basically going to be accessed as levers, and I'm going to end up just getting retract and completely smashed. Guard is slightly different in which we don't actually want to lock our legs out because it's going to make us susceptible to guard passing and our guards aren't going to be effective. Here I use my shin bones as frames, and I allow my quads to do a lot of the work to be able to support my opponent. Here I can actually lift Kevin up and have my legs not completely bent, but not completely locked out either, and be able to support a lot of weight. Here, looking at some uh, high leg for guard retention, I have my legs bent, but angled at a 45 degree angle to match the force that he's gonna generate. And as he redirects, I have to replace that frame by performing a high leg, putting my left leg against his shoulder and bicep, and using my spine and shoulder to support the weight at that 45 degree angle into the ground. Who are you? Elmer, I'm your guardian angel. I've assumed the form of someone you would recognize and revere. Sir Isaac Newton. Sir Isaac who? Oh, very well. <gasps> Colonel Clink! So Newton's first law is also known as the law of inertia. An object at rest stays at rest, and an object in motion stays in motion with the same speed and in the same direction unless acted on by an unbalanced force. So think of inertia from this example as an empty bucket and a bucket filled with sand. We recognize that the empty bucket is much easier to move, the one filled with sand is heavier, therefore harder to move. That means it has greater inertia. If we look at this woman trying to push a massive boulder, we recognize that that's never going to happen because the boulder has so much inertia and it's not going to be un acted on with an unbalanced force. But the human body is a little more complicated. Think of us as a box with four sticks out of it and a computer on top. Now, while you have your complete total mass, the weight of your entire body, each limb can actually be manipulated independently. And so these frames out sticking out of your body can be accessed as levers. And that the really the only strength you have behind that is your tricep, your bicep, your shoulder, and some of your back. And so what we want to do is try and create load-bearing frames. Load-bearing, supporting much of the overlying weight. Load-bearing frames are much more difficult to move due to the increased total weight and mass, therefore greater inertia. So as I talked about, frames are usually always positioned to oppose a force vector that is being generated from our opponent. So if Kevin was generating force and we put our arms together like this, our frames are designed driving straight into each other. We have force driving into me and I have force driving into Kevin. Sometimes though, force is not always going to be just so perfect uh, and opposing. It's going to be actually more of a perpendicular angle or getting closer to it. In the next video, we will talk about levers, but for now, if I had my arm out and it's a frame in this direction, but if Kevin was to push down on it, he's gonna access it as a lever because my arm is not able to generate force meaningfully to oppose that. Now, when we start looking at inertia and uh, load bearing frames, it becomes much harder to move the frames and access them as levers because as it starts to become load bearing, supporting much of the overlying weight above it, the inertia increases and it's going to take a lot more force to be able to pull it off to the side. So if I was to do like a one arm and have this hand floating at this point, there's no weight into it. And now if Kevin went to pull it out, it's very easy for him to manipulate this. But as I change this frame into a load bearing frame, as Kevin tries to access his lever and pull it out from underneath me, I'm actually probably going to slide along the mat and still keep a strong structure here before Kevin's actually able to pull the arm up from underneath me. I will now transport Sir Isaac Newton into the modern day. Warning, power failure. Oh, oh, oh sweet Clayton. Yeah, oh, good God. Hey, wait, wait, wait. Uh, ow, oh, oh, Sir Isaac's legs are hurting. So in this example of combat base, my foot is positioned way in front of my knee. And so my center of gravity is even further behind that. Now my leg can be accessed as a lever and Kevin's able to lift me up and he's able to dump me over completing a sweep. 
Here in proper combat base, I have my knee over top of my ankle and I have my center of gravity close to it. So now my leg is load bearing and it's very difficult for Kevin to move. Watch how hard he pulls and watch how my entire body slides with them as I keep proper base and structure. In this next example, we're going to be looking at preventing leg locks in the same sense. My knee is behind my ankle and my center of gravity is further back from that. My leg can now be accessed as a lever. So as Kevin pulls up at my Achilles, he's able to create heel exposure, dig on the heel and complete the heel hook. Here in this example, same thing, I align my knee over top of my ankle, my center of gravity is close by, and so now while Kevin tries to apply a perpendicular force to try and expose my heel, he's unable to because there's so much inertia behind this frame. This frame is now load-bearing. And this is one of the ways that I can protect myself from leg locks while I start to set up my ability to pass. Here in sweep prevention, as I stand up from the closed guard, my hips are too far back, as he starts to apply the muscle sweep, my knee drifts way behind my, my ankle, my hip gets externally rotated, and he's able to knock me down. However, this time I'm going to make sure I lean my center of gravity over top of my leg that he's starting to underhook. So once again, my knee is aligned over top of my ankle with my hips above that, so now it's a load-bearing frame. And watch how Kevin actually starts to get crushed up here. I start to be able to break his posture. As I break his alignment, I'm able to step back and break the guard effectively.